Uh, it is a, a vaccine that's been approved for emergency use in the United States. It's also approved in the UK and Canada, among other countries. Uh, and it's uh, different in terms of the mechanism of how it presents the antigen uh, to uh, the person's immune system. Thank you very uh, much. Is and a, um, a so how, how does it work? Tell us about uh, how the vaccine the works. States. Right. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, briefly and share and my screen, Canada, among other countries. Uh, and and uh, this is from in terms a of nice summary uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, to, uh, of uh, the phase the three trial from Pfizer uh, that uh, I think and, is useful um, for those that so are interested. How, how I shared work? this with our about, healthcare uh, uh, professionals yesterday. Right. So uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll just uh, what you can see screen, if uh, the screen is showing up there. Uh, and and is uh, this is, yes, uh, nice is that um, this is the Zimbabwe design medicine, of, uh, to, uh, the, uh, of the uh, uh, vaccine particle, from Pfizer. Uh, and uh, it is uh, comprised uh, of a messenger uh, RNA so how, molecule, which is really just a template uh, uh, that our bodies naturally so, uh, use uh, to uh, create uh, protein, which you can see. And it's enclosed in a fatty. Uh, envelope. And, is it showing? and yes. once that's introduced uh, into the arm uh, in a small dose, this is the it then enters of, into uh, the cell, uh, the it enters into just the cytoplasm, it doesn't go into the nucleus, messenger and RNA then molecule, uh, which is at that really point, just a template our own uh, that our protein is naturally uh, used to create protein, building which machinery, and it's uh, enclosed, uh, namely, namely ribosomes, creates a protein into antigen, and that's expressed on the surface of the cell. The At that point, uh, uh, the, into just the uh, immune system and so can then uh, be exposed to uh, uh, this antigen, uh, and it's in the pre-fusion uh, confirmation for those that are interested. Uh, and then uh, that develops the uh, B cell and T cell uh, immunity that is uh, shown to be very robust. And I'll just show very quickly uh, a neat graph that's included in, in the trial, which shows um, essentially how effective this vaccine is. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, so on the uh, x-axis here is time from first dose, uh, time zero is the first dose, and then time 21, day 21, is the second dose. And you'll see that uh, the blue line is the placebo uh, arm, uh, and uh, the red line is the uh, vaccine arm. And you can see after basically 12 days after the first dose, uh, that those two lines um, deviate significantly from each other. So the placebo line continues uh, to uh, have increasing number of cases. Uh, each of these little box is a case in the study. Uh, and uh, you can see that very few cases were seen in the, uh, in, in the treatment arm. And essentially, uh, out of the 18,198 individuals that received uh, the vaccine, only eight developed disease uh, versus 162 in the placebo working out to be a 95% effectiveness uh, with a confidence interval uh, that says that the true number is probably between 90 and 97.6%. Um, also in that trial, they showed uh, incidence of severe disease and these filled boxes are severe disease. And the reason I mention this is that you can see that there was really um, minimal severe disease seen in the vaccine arm. And so what this means is that the vaccine is effective in terms of reducing severe disease. In other words, uh, people uh, ending up in the ICU or dying. Okay, thank you. Um, so what, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is quickly go to um, some of the questions that are coming in quickly for, from Facebook. Um, so Dr. Armstrong, when will seniors be receiving the vaccine? So seniors are part of the group who fall into the priority group. When we think of the persons who are receiving the vaccines, we have those who are important to the continuity of the country those who are at higher risk and those who are at the front line. So when we think of individuals who are at higher risk, the seniors would fall into that category. We mentioned are the persons who live in rest homes having the vaccine. However, we have available for those who don't reside in the 
rest homes, they can call our hotline, the same hotline that is used for COVID information and press the option two, and they will be able to express their interest in having the vaccine. Um, and they can do this as, as, as soon as possible so that we can provide the time when they can receive the vaccine. Those, however, when we think of the, the, the seniors, we're gonna use a system that would, again, identify those who are at higher risk based on age and those based on, you may have a medical condition. So say, suppose you're 80 years of age and you may have a history of heart disease, um, you, you would be um, first in terms of being offered the vaccines compared to one, some person who is over 65, but you have no medical conditions. So that helps us to be able to identify those who are at highest risk. But yes, seniors have the opportunity to have the vaccine. Okay, excellent. And um, I just want to let people know what phone number they should call. 444-2498, option two. 444-2498, option two. Thank you, uh, Dr. Armstrong. Um, so I have a question uh, from somebody on Facebook and they're asking, uh, are we getting any vaccines from Oxford UK? Dr. Armstrong, do you wanna, do you wanna fill yeah. that one? So we, we have had co correspondence regarding the available to ask for Zanica vaccine. However, I cannot give you the time that it would arrive, but we are aware that um, there's a possibility that Bermuda will have access to that, that particular vaccine. Okay, excellent, thank you. And um, how would the vaccine affect those with an overactive thyroid and Graves autoimmune disease? Um, Dr. Ashton, go ahead. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, contra I'll just touch upon contraindications because I think that helps simplify the discussion a little bit um, because it can be a little bit confusing, but um, essentially based on the uh, trials that have been done thus far um, with thousands of subjects and now based on uh, additional uh, data that's being collected in real time uh, from those that are receiving uh, the vaccine in, in the millions uh, in, in other countries, um, we can say that uh, there is no um, absolute contraindication uh, for anything except for hypersensitivity reactions. So what that means is that um, specifically, if someone has had a history of anaphylaxis or severe hypersensitivity to any of the ingredients in uh, the Pfizer vaccine, um, and that includes polyethylene glycol um, or polysorbate, which is cross-reactive with uh, PEG, uh, then they should not receive uh, the vaccine. Um, all other conditions are um, uh, in some cases uh, precautions or, or not even precautions at all. So when it comes to autoimmune diseases and thyroid diseases, um, that is not considered uh, to be a contraindication for uh, the vaccination. And again, this is recognizing um, the severe risk at, uh, of COVID-19 disease and weighing that um, with uh, other risks. Um, thus far, there's been no evidence to say uh, that those with autoimmune disorders uh, should not receive the vaccine. That all being said, um, you know, this uh, um, session is not a replacement for a conversation with a healthcare professional that knows your specific uh, conditions well. And so I still urge you to, to talk with your doctors about this. But it, it, it is, uh, according to um, uh, all of the regulatory agencies, not an absolute contraindication. Okay, excellent. And so, um, Nurse Jackson, this question is for you. Um, what are some of the side effects um, we can expect after taking the vaccine? Thank you. Good question. Um, and the side effects are usually like they are with many other vaccines when you have, whether it be your flu shot or your tetanus shot, you can expect sometimes some soreness uh, and itching redness around the site where you actually have the, the injection. Sometimes some people will feel like the headache or they may get muscle aches or joint aches. And we do and expect that, that many people may in fact get those side effects, but they last for one or two 
days and, um, and then they go away. Uh, we, the data does suggest that sometimes those effects are felt more on the second dose than the first dose. But the important thing that we want people to know about is that we monitor side effects, whether they be minor or otherwise. So we ask that they contact their doctor if they are concerned about any of the side effects that they have after vaccination so that we can have a monitoring system, that we have a monitoring system in place um, to keep an eye on any side effects that go on with the vaccine. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um... Dr. Armstrong, I think this question is for you. Will those with the vaccine um, have to follow quarantine procedures once they've received it? Yes. So although you will have the vaccine, we will still have to abide by the public health measures that we are aware of. That is the use of mask, um, use of quarantine and hand, use of hand hygiene because um, we would have to have almost most of the population vaccinated to reach what we call herd immunity. And once we have not reached herd immunity, then the infection can still be transmitted among um, individuals. So that is why we would maintain the use of the public health measures, because as we would indicate that you can still have the COVID-19 um, infection. However, when you if you do get it, it will not be as severe as if you did not have the vaccine, and that's the the big the big um, note that we need to remember. So we will still have the public health measures in place. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, I think this question is for you as well. As healthcare professionals in the community-based medical office, uh, do we need to sign up to receive the vaccine? And um, the commenter says uh, both the staff are seniors. So. Remember, we said one of the criteria was for those who are at the front line. And if you're in the community and you're interacting with persons and you're providing care, you would be considered to be part of the front line individuals who should um, have the vaccine once you indicate that you wish to have the vaccine. So I would say yes to that question. Okay. And um, I'm just quickly looking through our questions. Uh, how long do we expect it to take for us to have uh, the supply and distribution for the general population, not just those at high risk? Dr. Armstrong, do you- So you presently, presently we're using priority groups because you would have recognized that we received 9,750 doses on Friday. That can only serve 4,875 persons. Once we are able to identify the, um, the other batches of the vaccine, then we'll be able to um, obviously provide that vaccine for more persons. For the 4,875 persons, it will take us about eight weeks, over eight weeks to get the two doses in. So we obviously would have to multiply that time um, for a greater number of persons to be vaccinated. And of course, I cannot give a specific time and that's at this point because I would have to find out how many persons um, do intend to have the vaccine in the general population. And so you, you just talked about two doses. What happens if let's say a person gets the first shot next week but forgets or doesn't show up uh, for the next dose? What happens to that person? Um, either one, Dr. Ashton, do you wanna, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, so um, in, in terms of the timing of the vaccine, um, uh, the, the study was pretty specific that it should be 21 days after the first dose. Um, uh, however, life is different. Uh, and so um, any time after the 21st dose, we, although we would uh, strive to have it at that same time, um, it would still be considered a, a valid uh, a vaccination series. Thank you. Um, Dr. Armstrong, I think this one may be for you. What emergency measures slash treatments would be in place if someone had an anaphylactic reaction? So at each vaccination site, there, there is an emergency plan in place. There are persons who are trained to respond to emergencies such as anaphylactic reaction and the appropriate tools are in position. 
In addition, we will also have the service of an ambulance in a case where the medical director on site reviews the patient and, and decides that this person needs to be transferred to hospital for whatever reason. So we do have emergency procedures in place for any eventuality that may or may not occur. All right, um, Nurse Jackson, uh, this one's for you. Um, there are some people, not me, but there are some people who get nervous uh, uh, when they have to consider getting a shot. And this is a shot of any kind. What guidance and advice do you have for these people who may be just a little nervous about getting um, a needle in, in their arm? Yep, we understand that. We face that all the time. So we do understand the anxiety. But it's so important that we try and, and remain calm, do some deep breathing as we have our shots. And so when people come for their COVID-19 vaccine, they will have the nurse with them to talk them through that and um, encourage them to do the deep breathing and remain calm so that their arm isn't, the, it isn't so tense. The shot does go into the muscle of the arm and so staying calm will help them not to be so tense and it's less uncomfortable during that shot. So it, 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 it's an important part and it's an important part for our nurses uh, working with people and talking them through that um, shot. So, but we certainly understand it. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Armstrong, if I've had COVID-19, should I get the vaccine? So you can get the vaccine even though you may have had COVID-19, but we'd say to you, if you've had COVID-19 within the last um, 90 days, that you should wait before you have the vaccine. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going back to my questions uh, from Facebook. So how do you know if you are on the essential list and, receive, and should receive the vaccine? Thank you for that question, Adaranka. So part of the process, in order to identify those who are considered essential workers, and these um, individuals may be per some person who is working with the police, they may be a firefighter, they're working in corrections, they're part of the border control um, staff. We've reached out to the different entities to inform them that they're part of the essential worker category and that they should provide a list of their members who are willing to have the vaccine. And what has happened that from these institutions, we have received a list of these individuals um, in addition, which will help us to identify them. And we have sent information saying you have appointment to, to come for the vaccine. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ashton, how long does the protection from the virus last after receiving the vaccine? Yeah, protection from the vaccine um, uh, lasts an unclear duration. That's one of the unknowns uh, based on uh, the study uh, that's been done, and only time is really going to give us an idea of that. Uh, we have reason to believe that the quality of the immune response will actually be, I think, better uh, than the natural infection, where um, that response is a little bit more messy. Um, and in fact, we know from natural infections uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, ineffective antibodies that are created, for example, uh, when when you get the uh, wild type virus. Um, uh, so we, we really don't know how long the protection will be. Um, it's on the order of at least months. Uh, and I, I think that that's one of the limitations of uh, the studies thus far. Uh, the other limitation that was pointed to um, uh, earlier by Dr. Armstrong is just this question of transmissibility of the virus after you've had the vaccine. And it's unclear uh, whether it uh, reduces that risk or not. And that's why for the uh, time being, we're asking everyone to continue all of the precautions that they've been taking. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Armstrong, I think this one is coming back to you. Um, how long is a person being monitored for an allergic re reaction after the vaccine? Yes. So for the general, the general the person would be asked to stay in the observation area for 15 minutes. However, if we are aware that they have some history um, that we may complicate the situation, we would ask them to wait for 30 minutes. And of course, we always say to persons, if you have any problems that occur, even after you leave 
um, the vaccination center, they need to inform us and of course inform their health professional so that they can get the required assistance that they may need. And um, I think this is another one for you. Does Bermuda have access to other vaccines other than the one currently on the island? So you would have heard in the news before that Bermuda was part of the COVAX facility um, that is the Gavi Alliance, which includes the Pan American Health Organization. So that's one source of our vaccines. And of course, you would be aware that we receive vaccines from public health through the Public Health England um, pathway. So those are the two pathways that would allow us access to the vaccines. Now, if people wanted to get some more information about the vaccines in Bermuda um, and they have questions uh, after today, where can they get information? They can visit gov.bm forward slash vaccines. Of course, they can call the helpline um, with the number that you provided before and choose option two, where they have um, trained personnel who can provide them with the appropriate information. Okay, and I'll just repeat the number, 444-2498, 444-2498. And that number may sound familiar because that's the general COVID hotline number. Uh, but for people who have very specific questions about the vaccine, you press um, number two, that's option two, and that will take you straight to somebody uh, who will be able to answer your questions about the vaccine. Um, I'm just looking at this, another question. Okay, as a frontline healthcare professional who wants, who wants to get the vaccine, uh, do I need to make an appointment or just show up or should I just call? What should I do? Dr. Um, Armstrong? So what we have done to identify frontline person, personnel who may not work with the Ministry of Health or with the um, hospital, we have identified focal points from particular um, associations. So if you are associated with the Bermuda Medical um, Associ Doctors Association or other associations, then you should reach out to the particular focal point who has been um, sending information to individuals to say, if you're interested in having the vaccine, please let us know because what will happen, that individual will um, provide the vaccination um, command center with a list of individuals who wish to have the vaccine. If you have not been able to do so, to speak to your um, association, then you can call the helpline and that will also allow you to make an appointment. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Ashton, can you talk about the testing and the types of people that um, were part of the testing prior to the vaccine being released? Yeah, so this goes back to the um, uh, study, the phase three study. And um, what I'll do is, uh, again, just share my screen, if I can, yeah. uh, and find the right table. This is from uh, the published article in New England Journal of Medicine. Bear with me, please. <laughs> okay. So, so while you're while you're doing that, Dr. Ashton, um, I'm just seeing another question that came up. Um, please provide clarity. Okay, so you've got it. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so. Um, uh, this uh, just gives you a description of the uh, study participants. And uh, so, uh, as you'll see again, there was uh, over 18,000 subjects in each arm. It was the gold standard randomized uh, placebo controlled blinded study. Uh, and in the vaccine arm, uh, there were uh, this number of individuals, and then you've got the placebo arm here. Uh, and what you can see is that the uh, breakdown for male to female was basically 50-50. Uh, in terms of uh, ethnicity, you'll see that uh, it was predominantly a white population with 83%. Uh, and then uh, Black or African American population was just under 10%. Uh, Asian population was 4.3% and so on. 
Uh, what you'll also see here is the breakdown of uh, the countries uh, that were involved. Uh, you can see this was a multinational study. Uh, and you can see that it also uh, studied age groups from 16 through uh, to older ages uh, above 55. Uh, and you can see uh, in this table, it talks about uh, one in three, over one in three uh, had a body mass index that uh, showed that they were obese. That's um, pretty much the standard prevalence among these countries. Uh, and then uh, what's not shown in this table, but is also important is that there were a number of other comorbidities that were included. This was basically your typical population uh, and it was powered to, uh, to be able to detect um, signal uh, in at least a, a rate of one in 10,000. Anything that's more rare than that uh, would not be picked up on this. And, and that's where uh, we will have to rely on the millions of people that are receiving the vaccine in real time and the, and the data that's coming from that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I have another question. Um, why do you have to wait 90 days if you've already had COVID before you can get the vaccine? I can just take that one real quickly. Um, and, and, and you don't uh, at, from, a, from a vaccine standpoint. Um, you do need to be asymptomatic, uh, but uh, what we're also dealing with is a supply issue, and we really don't know what the demand versus supply is. And so uh, the CDC, among other regulatory bodies, have advised that um, for those that um, have had the infection, uh, that uh, likely you're immune for at least 90 days. And so that's an opportunity for us to actually give the vaccine to others um, that have no immunity. So it's really a supply demand issue. Okay, thank you. Um, and please provide some clarity to the public that the second dose has to be from the same manufacturer, particularly for the elderly. So um, it, I, I will just say that the, the recommendation is that it be from the same vaccine. Um, but um, if an error were to happen such that you've got different types of vaccine, uh, then that would still be uh, considered uh, um, valid. Um, it's not optimal, but uh, we wouldn't be recommending additional doses or d additional series. Okay, and um, just looking at the time, so I, I'll go for a few more questions. Um, so Dr. Armstrong, uh, the question is, as a 75 year old with diabetes and heart problems, how can I sign up for the vaccine? So just remind everyone that they can call the hotline and they can provide their information and the team will be in contact with you regarding your appointment. Okay. And um, I'll give you each an opportunity to just say a few words before we close. Uh, Dr. Ashton, would like to start? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short, um, but uh, <laughs> as much as possible. But, um, so, I think that as you approach the, uh, the question of whether to get the vaccine uh, approach, I would approach it as I would any medical decision that's complex. Uh, and so this is about informed decision-making. And uh, I think you, one unfortunately has to recognize that given how rampant uh, COVID-19 is in the world and on the island, um, unless you're going to shield yourself indefinitely you uh, statistically will likely be exposed at some point to uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus. And um, we know uh, that unfortunately, the uh, infection fatality rate is still quite significant. That's the number that is really, I think, the most reliable measure of harm. And it's somewhere between 0.1 and 1%. Um, and then in terms of severe disease, um, that requires hospitalization, we're talking 10 to 15%, uh, and one in 20 will, will need to be admitted to the ICU. Um, so, you know, essentially, you know, we're posed with uh, a, a world where uh, there is a significant disease prevalence and it's, um, it, it, it's a significant risk. Uh, when you look at um, the data that's come out of a very well-designed uh, trial that's heavily scrutinized, 
uh, and um, is also replicated by another company, Moderna, with very similar results, by the way, independently, um, you look and you see, well, there were no deaths that occurred that could be linked to this vaccine. Uh, similarly, there were actually no anaphylactic reactions uh, in the trial, though now we know that there were 21 in the millions that have uh, now received uh, the vaccine. Um, but all in all, uh, the side effect profile is uh, excellent and very similar to what we would see in other vaccinations. Um, we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine, but we know that it's highly effective. We also, by the way, don't know the long-term effects of COVID-19. Mm -hmm, uh, and uh, what we can say is that if you get it, it's a very severe disease a lot of the time. So weighing both of those, I, 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 I uh, would encourage people to think through this. Um, this is a good problem to have in terms of having the opportunity to um, at least consider the vaccine. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, Nurse Jackson, you're next on my screen. Uh, any closing words and then we'll go to Dr. Armstrong. As uh, Dr. Ashton also said, I mean, I would just help people to realize, to get the information, get the facts um, and consider the information that is available. Use appropriate sources um, and be mindful of the sources of information that you get um, to be able to make that decision. Speak with either your, your healthcare provider, with the nurses that you know about, and, and know that uh, we've put a lot of planning and preparation for persons to receive the vaccine. And uh, we, we plan to discuss that with persons uh, before vaccination. We want you to get all of the information so we can help you in your decision making, um, but also when there are questions around it and we're available to discuss that and we encourage persons to discuss it. And we want people to discuss it even as a family because uh, COVID-19 actually doesn't just affect the individual, it's affecting families as well. So we want families to have that discussion um, and it's important even in the workplace for people to consider the discussion as well for themselves. So um, it's important, it affects all of us. Um, we're in this together and uh, we encourage that discussion and information based on facts and the available evidence that is coming out. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Armstrong, I'll give you the closing, um, closing remarks. Yeah, so I, I support both what my colleagues have said and I would say that there are credible sources of information out there. The, the Ministry of Health has provided a website, um, gov.bm slash forward slash vaccines. And we have the information hotline that they can, if they have questions regarding how do they receive the vaccine and whether they're eligible at this point in time, they should call the hotline. The number was given before, option two. Um, it is, it is op operational Mondays to Fridays between 8.30 and 3.30 p.m. And we are willing to take your questions and offer the appropriate advice as needed because I know people have lots of questions that we may not have been able to answer this evening. Here is an opportunity to have the vaccine and let's not be um, foiled by myths or misinformation make sure you, you get the right information that will make a difference um, for yourself and your family, as mentioned before by everyone. And thank you. Um, thank you um, to each of you. I, just to give the number uh, that people can call on Monday, it's 444-2498, option two, to get your questions answered about the COVID-19 vaccine. I'd like to thank the panelists who have joined uh, me this evening. I appreciate your time, everybody that has joined us online and on CITV. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We will have another session uh, to answer questions from members of the public, just like this one, next Saturday at 6 p.m. And we'll be live on uh, Facebook, we'll be live on CITV, and you can also see us on government's website our gov.bm and um, YouTube. So we're trying to reach people wherever they are, wherever they get their information, we will be there. So sign up, join us, and we'll see you next week for another edition of uh, Vaccine Awareness. Join the discussion. Good night, everybody. Good night.